Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the perfect... Wait. What's that? Is that the Binge Watch Boys music? Oh my god, this is unbelievable! What's up, bingers? This is the Binge Watch Boys podcast, where we binge all your favorite shows. Yeah, unlike all those other nerds at the Perfect Movie Podcast, we talk about the stuff that people watch, and not some old-ass, boring-ass movies nobody cares about. Yeah, we talk about all your favorite movies from all your favorite streaming services, like HBO Max, Hulu, Disney Plus, Netflix, Paramount Plus, Apple TV Plus, Peacock, Discovery Plus, Showtime, Crunchyroll, <laughs> AMC Plus, BET Plus. <laughs> 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 Stars, Epics Now, Acorn, Britbox, All Black, PBS Passport, and the unending silence of death. Bro? Yeah, on this podcast, we talk about all your favorite streaming shows. Like Succession, Stranger Things, The Umbrella Academy, Euphoria, Invincible, Severance, Mrs. Marvel, Moon Knight, WandaVision, Loki, Marvel's What If, The Witcher, Star Trek Picard, Star Trek Discovery, <laughs> Star Trek. <laughs> I, I think I, we switched on. The Witcher. Star Trek Picard. Star Trek Discovery. Star Trek Strange New Worlds. The Mandalorian. Obi-Wan Kenobi. The Book of Boba Tfet. Doom Patrol. Chucky. Peaky Blinders. Reacher. The Boys. The Wheel of Time. Tokyo Vice. Peacemaker and Raised by Wolves. There's so much great stuff to binge watch. You know what they're going to say about this podcast? What? It broke new ground! Dude, you just black out for a minute? Uh, I think so. D did you? Yeah. Oh. Well, anyways. All right. Hello and welcome to the Perfect Movie Podcast. The podcast where we answer the question, is this a perfect movie? And today, we're not answering that question at all. <laughs> we're talking about a TV show. What? <laughs> <laughs> the show in discussion is Stranger Things. Ever heard of it? It's probably like the biggest thing on Netflix. One of the biggest things in the world right now. I mean, it's a... Uh Cultural phenomenon. For sure. For sure. And um, I'm Michael. Kalen. And I watched Stranger Things as it came out. So I was watching each season kind of as it came out. Actually, it was like a perfect storm because I'm actually not the type to get into like streaming shows for the most part. I'm just afraid of the commitment. But I happened to watch Stranger Things season one. I was like in college. I was moving out of my dorm and moving into this house, but I didn't have, like, there was a couple days where I needed, like, the person wasn't going to move out, so I stayed at a friend's apartment, and I didn't have anything to do but sit on the couch, so I just watched Stranger Things as it came out, whatever summer that was. I thought it was great. Season one, really, uh, you know, I thought it was really amazing, and here we are, three seasons later, mm -hmm. and I think... In my opinion, season four is probably the best season since season one. And it's kind of what, what is up for discussion today, season four. And that's how that's how I that's how I watched it. And you kind of watched it the opposite way. Yeah. So <clears throat> I came into this fairly recently. Um, I had been putting the show off for a long time. I don't really know why I didn't get into it. I telling you to watch it and you were like, no, this looks too many children. Yeah, you... <laughs> I'm kind of over the whole 80s trope of like... Yeah, that's actually what you said. Kids running around on bikes and getting into hijinks and stuff and going on adventures. I was kind of over that whole thing. Um, 
this really surprised me. I actually started watching this a couple weeks ago. Um, I binge watched the entire thing in like two weeks, um, up until season four. Uh, it really surprised me it, just how great the characters were and just how you kind of, I mean, I, I'm sure you feel this more cause you watched it over a longer time period of like really growing with those characters and just seeing them. I mean, each season they're older, like you know, the kids are literally aging. They're literal children yeah. turning into like Noah Schnapp. I just saw a thing. It's I'm sorry, I'm diverting a little bit, but I just saw a thing where Noah Schnapp, the guy that plays Will, is beefing with Doja Cat I've online. Seen, I've seen that. It's the dumbest thing. But ever. he's like 17 now, and I think, and I started to watch again when you started watching, thinking I'd be able to keep up with you, but then you flew right past me. But when I watched, I did watch season one again recently, and and I was just shocked by how small they are when I'm watching yeah, season look four. Like, they look like babies. They are <laughs> I mean, so tiny. Yeah. And so... This show, like I said, took me by surprise. I actually, I, I love it. I mean, it's fantastic. Um, it's probably one of the better shows, if not the best show on Netflix right now. Um, yeah, I just, I was super excited for season four. So when that dropped, I was definitely right on it. Saw it out the gate and yeah, here we are. Yeah. So I think with that, we're going to get into the performance test. It was the performance of a lifetime. The performance test is where we talk about our favorite performers, actors, and characters. Um, and that's really where the show shines. I think the thing that this show does that most things, most shows, a lot of shows, like when we yelled about Kenobi, or I'm sure when we talk in the future about things that we don't like, oh, that is, I think, usually where shows fail or movies is when they don't respect the characters and like put the plot in front of like building characters and, and character making, progression. Yeah. And making them like, you know, feel like fully realized humans and not just things to get to the next like moment. And I think another thing the show does really well is they handle child actors. Well, or at least the casting is just top notch. I mean, they these, don't miss. No, they don't. And these, the kids that are in the show, I mean, they're incredible. Um, they're just so believable. And, you know, Finn Wolfhart, he's kind of known now as, like, yeah, the kid was... you hire for every 80s movie ever. So, <laughs> or every 80s, like, what was he in? He was in It. He was in It, and he was in that Ghostbusters remake. Oh, he was in Ghostbusters was. Afterlife? Yes. And oh I don't know God. if that was set in the 80s or not, but it had that Goonies feel where they're on bikes. And, you know, they're, I they're think doing it's, the whole kid adventure thing. Yeah, it's set now, but it's, like, oh, it's all 80s nostalgia. Yeah. Which this show does, but I don't think it's in the... Uh... It's not in an annoying way. No, like, they do it very tastefully, I think. Like, I, I remember, was it in season two or is it in season one where they all show up in their little Ghostbuster outfits? Season two, I believe. It doesn't matter. But, like, when you look at that photo, you think, like, this is dumb 80s pandering. Yes. But, I don't know, something about it feels very... They are four friends. What else would you do if you had four best friends in the 80s? You know, I mean, and these kids were like they're in a Dungeons and Dragons, and like you know they're the stereotypical nerds mm -hmm. in this in this world or whatever. So you know they show up to school in their Ghostbusters outfits, and nobody else is wearing any. I mean, it's a it's great, What's and it's cute, <laughs> and it's funny, and it it just works perfectly for that genre. And one of them, and none of them, two of them come as the same character, and they're like, <laughs> and the one says to Lucas, he's like, you should have been, I forget his name, but he was basically like, you should be the black guy. And Lucas is like, <laughs> yeah, why? Why? <laughs> why is that? <laughs> That's another thing about this show, is that they have political aspects in this show that isn't annoying. It doesn't feel like a, it doesn't feel like, oh, look at us. Look at us make a statement about yes, something. Yes, they do it very tastefully. They kind of ease into these these subjects and these topics, but they don't go overboard with it. And if, they, if anything, they just mention it a few times, and then they leave it at that. And that's something I just, I don't know, the direction of this, this show and just the people behind the cameras who are doing the writing. I mean, it's just fantastic. I think, I think the Duffer brothers are writing it. They're, they're the writers and showrunners, and they're pretty good. They have a movie that came out. I think it's called The Hidden or something i need to check it out it's not in any streaming services so i have to like actually go is that the movie with the guy and he's got the mask is it has a it has i don't know if it's a horror movie but it's i think it has stellan skarsgård the guy that played it bill or, that's bill that's, skarsgård. okay so yeah. it's another skarsgård but i don't know i don't know much about the movie but it makes me interested in it because they're just like they're so good at this yeah and and, and like like i said 
characters built up and they're amazing and do you have anything else otherwise i want to do not good i want to do my character power rankings go for it so it, you know what is better on the internet than making a list about shit <laughs> To make people ask mad. every YouTube video. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> what is the point of? And this is this uh, to be clear. My list is for season four. Now, if it's a character that's been with us, you know, t seasons two through four, one through four, whatever, that's taken into account. I can't forget about that stuff. Yeah. But this is like a list based on everything we've watched up to now. Okay. These are my top five favorite characters, and I think you'll be shocked who's number one. Maybe you won't be, but okay. So number five, newcomer, Eddie. Eddie Munson. Mm, I know it. So fucking lovable. Yeah. He's such a lovable guy. The scene with him and the girl that's buying drugs, the first kill of Vecna, mm -hmm. so good. Like, I at first I wasn't into him. I was like, this guy's a little over the top. When he's like flip, standing on the table in the lunchrooms and everything, I'm like, this guy is going to get annoying. He's a little over the top, but he's also a little bit like where the uncanny value where it's like... I think I knew somebody like this. You he's know? like, he seems like a theater kid. That's what he seems he, like. Yes. Yeah, so super <laughs> over the top and super like flamboyant and just expressive. And he's like, what? He's a super senior. He's like a third year senior. So he's like a 20 year old <laughs> yeah. hanging out with a bunch of 14 year olds. And he's selling drugs. <laughs> and he's selling drugs to them and everything. And, and it's funny. He's just, he's just so, he's so lovable. And then he gets like, maybe there's a few cool moments in the, in the finale last two episodes. But uh, I think he might have the the best trailer shot. In, oh, definitely when in the we, whole yeah. in in the whole show. When at the very end, which before I get into this, this is a full spoiler Stranger Things podcast. If you don't want to be spoiled, we're we're yeah. uncovering it all. Yeah, we we probably should have said this earlier, but yeah. Yeah. So yeah. if 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 you want to come back, come back. Otherwise, get out if you don't want to hear them. Yeah, and if you haven't watched it, what are you doing? Stop this video. Or you, whatever, this audio, and go watch it. Right. <laughs> you have nothing else better to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but when he's, uh, when they gotta distract all the, like, demon bats that are in the underworld, and they've been teasing his guitar that's on the wall in his trailer, and it comes up over and over again, and then he finally pulls it down, and he plays, what is it, Master of Puppets? It's, mas it's Master of Puppets. By, I believe that's by Metallica. By Metallica, and at first I was like, Ride the Lightning, but no. It yeah. might, I, I forget it's, which one it's it is. It's one of them. I think it's Masters of, uh, Masters of Puppets. But. And he just starts ripping guitar riffs it's to this track. It. And there's red lightning going on in the background. And you're just like, hell yeah. And what's his name is like cheering him on. <laughs> Dustin. Dustin is just, Dustin's like, yeah. He's like, yeah. <laughs> this is awesome. And that's one of those things where like in a lesser show, when it wants to do that moment, it's not hitting me. Right. Or movie. I'm like, this is fucking corny. Or they'd He's, play that song just for the sake of it. Right. Like nostalgic aspect and he's just playing like like in a lesser show i would be rolling my eyes and thinking this is the dumbest thing ever right like really their plan is to go in the underworld and he's gonna shred a guitar solo like why are we doing it yeah but since you're built into this character you think eddie's funny he's been done wrong he's like a good guy he's been helping out you know like he's while he's like maybe a little iffy drug dealer he's like also this guy that takes all the like freshmen under the wings yeah. and he's you know giving them a place to be themselves go play dungeons and dragons right. he's like leader of the hellfire club and he's like i'm the leader now i'm gonna bequeath this to y'all later and yeah he's just you you really start to root with him over the time of the season so by the time he's up on top of the trailer red lightning in the background he's just sh fucking shredding you're like yes eddie's it, the best and it was it's awesome and the thing is about that scene, or even if seeing in the trailer, like, oh yeah, I know his fate already. Like, <laughs> yeah, I know what's gonna happen to this guy, and that that part was a little disappointing to me, just because I I like that character so much. Yeah, um, our, wait, Eddie Munson, R.I.P. Moment of silence. <laughs> All right, continue. <laughs> <laughs> um. Do you have any more characters to go through? Okay, no, that's just, that's just number five on my list. And also, after oh, I get yeah. to the top of the list, I'm going to go through a bunch of honorable mentions. Because that's the show. This show is characters that you love. Yes. It's hanging out with people that you like. The story is not that... Is background. There are problems with yes. the story. There's there's a things that, that's, that's the thing about me that I think some people... like. I, can, I would say, I stand this show. I love this show, but I'm not a person that is 
that will like refuse to acknowledge flaws in something that I like. Yeah. And there are some flaws in this show, but the thing that it nails so much is giving you all these characters that you care about. And Eddie Munson, number five. Sweet. Number four, Jim Hopper. He's my he's my number one. He's your number per- one? Personally. I love him too. He's the one number one, the actor, what's his name? Uh oh shit. Now you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I know it, but now that I'm on the point, just keep going and I'll and I'll, I'll get it. Jim Hopper, uh, he starts off as this. We don't want to get into too much of the older seasons, but no, he starts can, off as this like disgruntled. It's all part cop, of it. This disgruntled cop, and he's in this small town, and he doesn't really have shit to do, and he just went through a, a huge tragedy in his family. He lost his daughter, and um, it's David Harbor. David Harbor, yeah, fantastic actor. Um, he was in Hellboy though, so <laughs> I mean. and he was also in the the least memorable Marvel movie, Black Widow. I'm starting or, to. I think I realize that it's never the actor's fault; it's all always the writers. Yeah, nah, but he's great. Continue. Um, <clears throat> so he's just this grumpy old man, basically. Um, and Joyce is coming in freaking out about her missing son, and he's yeah. like, "All right, like you think he's gonna be." He, you think he's going to be the character, like the sheriff that's no help, that's right. just blowing you off. But he's actually like, he's starting to see some weird shit going on. He's like, oh, I better actually check this out. And I think it's like, that's a character mo- moment again, where it's like, I have a purpose again, where I can go out and try to be a detective and do all these things and like help people. And and it ties into his backstory. It like, ties into his backstory and just ties into his character as a person. And just who he is and like <clears throat> when he, his relationship with those children and how he takes in l as his own daughter and i mean those are just great moments too one one of my favorite hopper moments i uh, only caught this because my sister was re-watching it um uh, not re-watching it she was catching up to season four and she was watching season three and in season three when l and uh mike are dating and they're like hanging out in the room and he's trying to like he's gassing himself up to get ready to have the discussion yeah. about at first he's like peeking in there to make sure they're not in there doing no freaky stuff <laughs> like... yeah and it's so funny because they're definitely in there making out and then he like op- and before he even opens the door he's like trying to go through a script like i just want us to have safe boundaries and he's like yeah. trying to maintain his shit and not freak out and be calm because mike is such an asshole to him <laughs> yes. and, like, <laughs> and then he just snaps so like he opens the door and then all of a sudden they're just like dead still on two different sides of the bed and i laughed at that shot as they're just sitting there because i've been there i was that teenager oh, that <laughs> is such a relatable moment and yeah. like i mean I remember my dad doing shit like that. It's just so funny because it's just so real. So like he sits in there and he's sitting there and he's like struggling to start. And then Mike's like, ah, I think we're in trouble. And then he just snaps. He's like, Mike, let's go. And he takes him in the and he takes him in the car and he just starts screaming at him. He's like, this is how it's going to be. You're going to not talk. Like he's, he's like, basically, you're going to say goodbye and you're not going to talk to me. And you like, he just kicks him out. He's just done with them. And it's just so... Uh, that's him like the the duality of man eh? like yes. he, he's trying to do better but then he keeps going back on his on his worst I think impulses. what i love the most about his character too is like as he progresses more and more in each season he becomes more and more of a badass we're at like season four he's basically rambo you know? yeah <laughs> he's like when he got he lost a ton of a ton of weight because he was in a soviet prison camp yeah and then he's fighting it, but, but somehow he's so like, shredded with the six pack when he takes <laughs> right. off his shirt after his starvation diet just turns you into fucking i mean if you're doing hard labor and not eating anything i'm sure anybody i mean i mean i guess that's the key Um, i didn't know (laughs) but yeah he's a total badass towards the end it's great i thought it was gonna be a whole scene when he's fighting that demogorgon they go back in the prison he's fighting the demogorgon and he like pulls up the sword i bet in the original edit like i bet there's like an eight minute version of that fight but they cut it down to like 20 seconds (laughs) but it was entering that realm of like okay this is kind of ridiculous <laughs> you know actually fun fact that sword is the same sword from the conan the barbarian movies whoa yeah it was like an actual prop for the movie i don't know it's why i threw homework. that in there but how do you know that i read an article <laughs> <laughs> i really avid did. reader Caitlin davis <laughs> you know don't read no books but all right <laughs> i'll read no books but i'll read a damn article all right jim hopper badass caring i ship him with joyce yeah, Seems earned. I think it's earned. They yeah. didn't go, you know, they didn't go into like the forever will they, won't they type of deal. And they're no. likable and it seems like something that. And it's kind of, they've always had that tension 
to begin with too so yeah and at least they, they're like you know they're two people of similar age r.i.p bob though r.i.p bob he's in he's in the the honorable mentions that i'll get to oh great all right so number four jim hopper number three the maybe my favorite of the our quartet of friends dustin henderson yeah cool hat cool teeth or cool. Cool well, no teeth. Cool no teeth. He can do that cool trick because he has no clavicle where he turns like his arm behind his back. They didn't make him do that in like season one, I oh, think. Oh, he's a interesting guy. Huh? And I really like uh, Dustin. He's just, uh, I think he's like the, the at first Mike was, but once Mike got, got paired off with L, he's like the heart of the quart, the quartet. He's the one that's like, y'all, we, yeah. we got to come together with this. Yeah. Except for in season two when he accidentally <laughs> befriended and adopted a, a like a demo dog and kept oh, it at yeah, his house that was... <laughs> <laughs> classic kids being stupid yeah i mean like even pack. that even that like in a dumber show you're like this why is he doing this this doesn't make any sense but you're like he thinks this thing is cute and he has a scientific curiosity about and this that was thing the thing he, he was like i discovered a new species like i'm I'm taking the credit for this. <laughs> right. When he showed it to the teacher, he made that sure, like made that clear. He was like, I'm getting the credit for this. Yeah. And then, and then Dustin also gets a lot of time, him and Steve. Great duo. Once he's just got the best duos in the show. I mean, whenever he's paired with somebody, he just clicks yeah. with them really well. Dustin and Steve, then Dustin and Eddie. They're just, they're just fun guys. He's yeah. a fun guy. Maybe the most charming. He also has the best swears. The best child swears all go to Dustin <laughs> Anderson. He's got the funniest ones. Yeah, dropping the S word all the time. <laughs> Shit. He says. <laughs> um, I think my favorite, and I, I'm going back to the Who's your best? Oh, go ahead. For with the Dustin moment, the moment where he sang the never ending story song. It, that was the season finale of, or the, se the finale of season three with his girlfriend yeah 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 and they're singing it and it's they're over the, the on the radio the radios or whatever yeah it was such a, a good oh. i mean the music with it was just like it was just great this, i love that he thing. came back from camp and he's like i have a girlfriend everybody's and like nobody no, believes no, no you don't you do not have a girlfriend and he's making his friends haul <laughs> his uh, friends are like hauling a massive radio <laughs> to, the top, <laughs> to the top of a hill so they can communicate so he can prove that he has a real girlfriend <laughs> I mean, don't oh. we all want friends like that, though? Oh. Dustin. <laughs> Dustin's the best. No, broke his leg, this one, right? He broke his leg falling through the... Falling, falling through, through into the upside down. Or out of the upside down, I think. No, Either into way. the upside down from the portal that was in yeah. the... Um, in Eddie's roof. Yeah, in the trailer park, or the trailer home. And, uh, yeah, you know, we, we, cast a, we cast a safety spell around Dustin. Protects Dustin at all costs. If we're going to kill any main characters, not Dustin Henderson. Yeah, I feel like there would be an outrage. Yeah. All right. Number two. Kind of paired with Dustin Henderson. Steve Harrington. Yes. Steve is definitely up there for me. He's, I think what I really like about Steve is he, he has genuine character growth. Yeah, he starts off as a complete dick. Like, he's a dick. I think even in season one, he comes around. Like, he's a prick, but he's not the biggest prick. Because you remember when, um, after he loses the fight to Jonathan and oh, his he friend. he spray painted the. Yeah, when he spray painted the thing that, like, Nancy's a whore or whatever. Yeah, about Nancy. Nancy's yeah. a slut. And after that, I think he realizes, A, he realizes he's fucked up. He goes back and he tries to help clean it up. And he's like talking with, he has that douchey friend with the girlfriend, like the redheaded guy and his girlfriend who are just the worst. They are like the real slimes. They're real terrible. I mean, the girl, like the, she was just always saying something. I just, yes. like, I want to reach to the screen and punch you in the <laughs> fucking face. And like at the end, he's like, fuck you guys. Yeah. Like my friends that I had before, you guys are assholes and I don't want to be like you. Yeah. I'm done with this. Yeah. And he goes back to Nancy and he's not there to fight someone. He's not there to break everything up. He's not there to rage. He just wants to be like, look, I fucked up. That was not a good thing for me to do. Yeah. And he ends up in the middle of their whole like demon fight, demogorgon right. fight at the end of the at the end of the series. But also in season three, Steve gets paired off with Robin at the ice cream shop, mm -hmm. and he has this whole arc where he thinks Robin's weird, and then he starts being like, I'm into Robin. I think I like yeah. Robin. Yeah. And then that goes on for a while, and you think, oh, is Steve and Robin going to be a thing? And then there comes a revelation. That's in like a bathroom in, yeah, in the when mall somewhere. After they got done being drugged by the Soviets. Yeah. They oh had, yeah. They had escaped the uh, underground facility. Yeah. And and he's like he starts to ask, you know, he's he starts to 
you know, try to pop the question. Yeah. And she's like, oh. And she's like, no. And he's like, oh. And she's like, it's not like that. You know, I'm just not really into boys. Yeah. He's like, uh, And it was uh, done very tastefully. Oh. And yeah. he doesn't ship off. He's not like, I'm not into this. No. He's like, no, we can be friends. They don't do anything that makes you hate him. I'm cool with being like, friends. Yeah, he's fine with it. And then furthermore, come around season four, he starts, seems like he's having feelings with, for Nancy again. Yeah. He sees Nancy separated from Jonathan. They're not really a, they're not really an item for Nancy most of season four. Nancy needs to pick four. a lane, man. Holy <laughs> shit. But what I actually like about how they handle this is Nancy's, I don't really know how Nancy feels, but, but like it, it, they're on, they're in the upside down. And he has, they have that talk where he's like, you know, Nancy, thank you for like waking me up. I was being an asshole and that was not the right way to act. And I'm really glad that you like just helped me be a better person. Yeah. And, you know, I think if you met me now in a different way, like if, if timeline shifted and you could meet this better person today, we probably could have worked out. Right. Is basically his. And they kind of just left it at that. Yeah. And I think in a dumber show, they would have kissed. And there would have been like the whole like oh yeah drama it would have been awkward when Jonathan showed up and yeah everything. and there and it still is a little bit but I think that's important for him because he didn't cross that line yeah he didn't try to do that yeah. he just said his piece and left it open I mean right right this might change in season three who knows yeah, what who knows? or season five who knows what happens but again respect his character respect his character growth and he didn't revert to you know being like a home wrecker or whatever yeah. he's just bros before hoes i don't think that's the, the little lesson here but. <laughs> <laughs> all right and this is gonna shock you i think number one nancy wheeler whoa do you not like nancy wheeler i don't okay so what i think, I think she's think, pretty annoying I, I, what i love about nancy nancy is our ripley nancy has become over the course of time, and I think it's earned, she's become a badass. Because think back, every single season, when shit hits the fan, she's like the person that's like, I'm going to do something. Yeah, she's always getting strapped up. Simulate a plan, and I'm going to make things work. Yeah. Season one, they're like, him and her and Jonathan say, you know, we, we're we going to confront it at the house. They go and do it. She's down to ride for homicide. Mm-hmm. Or like season, I think it's season three, she gets the job at the... She gets the job at the she's like at the newspaper. Uh, she's like an intern journalist or whatever. And all the all the <laughs> all the workers are being super sexist. They're <laughs> yeah. like, "Oh, Nancy, get in the coffee too hard for you, sugar tits." That was a little over the top, <laughs> but I mean, it was, but it's whatever. It, it was, was funny. it was, but yeah. I love that every time that happens, she gets that like determined look on her face. She goes mm -hmm. like, hmm. "She's and definitely she's, a go getter," and I she's respect like, her for that. She's like, "No, I'm gonna go." Like she picks up the phone, she, she hears about the the rats that are acting weird, and she's yeah. like, "I'm gonna investigate this self. I'm gonna go get this shit. I'm gonna go do it." Yeah. And then by season four, I think when she's like there and she's like sawing off a shotgun, and she's like, "Yeah, this is just what I fucking do now." Yeah. I. I respect it, and I feel like that's always been her character, even when she's bookish, like season one nancy where she's like the nerd of the school that's just starstruck to be with oh popular steve harrington like i think that's all been earned because she's you know she's always been the go-getter person whether it's been i'm gonna go get these good grades now it's like i'm gonna go shoot these demons yeah. verbal meme soldier boy talking about his studio shootout but it's nancy wheeler <laughs> <laughs> talking about killing, <laughs> talking about killing demons <laughs> <laughs> I'm not denying any of this. I totally get it. And I understand it. Um, I think my problem with her kind of stemmed from that season three when she was the journalist or like the, the she was aspiring to be a journalist where it's kind of seemed like every decision that she made was f selfish, especially when it came to like Jonathan and Jonathan is trying to be this, the voice of reason, but she's being irrational where it's like. She's like, I don't need a Jonathan pep talk. And, but he's like, at, at the same time, he's trying to give you advice so you're not being self-destructive. That's and the one season I haven't seen any of recently. So you might need to remind me what Okay, happened. so there's a scene when they're in the car and they're having like a discussion about their job and basically their relationship. And and I the way she came off, it was a little bitchy. And I was like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not really shipping this. I don't know. I, yeah. Um, I think she's 
like you said, the progression with her character where it's like she's not the timid girl from the season one anymore where she's like she's locked and loaded, she's ready to fucking ride. That's great and that's cool. But I don't know, there's something about her and some I can't really narrow anything down. It's just from what I've seen and it's it's a lot to digest and to get through, but yeah. I, I don't know. I I'd never saw her as like a standout character. Yeah, I think that's fair. I just I just really like that she Yeah. She's consistently a go-getter. <laughs> it's like her relationship with Mike is so weird. It's like, I, I don't think there's really many scenes where they interact with each other. No, but that's just the show constantly splitting people off yeah, into like yeah. trios and quads. It's like you almost forget that. Oh, that's her brother. Yeah, that's her little brother. <laughs> yeah. That happened, I think it was at the end of like season one where she's like, oh, damn, Mike, a lot of shit happened. But you know, that's another thing that I love about the parents in this show. It's like the they parents, don't care. they're so oblivious <laughs> to everything. Like their dad is that, that classic blue collar worker and he's like, gets home, he sits on his chair all night and he's like sleep by the end of the night or whatever. He does not, it's like their kids are always out. I'm like, where are the parents? Yeah, uh, Miss Wheeler was going to risk it kids. all for some Billy Dick. <laughs> 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 that was weird. But I, I understood it. Though. I kind of bought it, and then I really liked that they pulled back from it when she like saw him asleep with her kid on his chest. Yeah. And saw her husband. And she was like, "Damn, yeah, I can't do this. I can't really do this." I mean, that's like that classic like uh, housewife kind of thing. The yeah. trope of a housewife where they're cheating all the time <laughs> and stuff. But that's my number one. All right, honorable mentions: Argyle. Not a lot to say. Just a great time. Another good season four edition. Just, I mean, he's a, he's a, not a stereotype. What's the word? He's a cliche. He's like the stoner cliche, but he's very funny. I, I find him funny. He's funny. He kind of got annoying in the second half of the, the season when, especially when they're in the pizza shop and like trying to do the icebox thing. He's kind of, he's borderline irritating. That whole icebox sequence I had problems with. It seemed like they didn't know what to do with these characters at some yeah. point, and so it le turns into like five people standing around L doing shit. And that's usually, I mean, that happened in a couple se like a couple seasons. Yeah, back in anyway, so. this will probably be we'll get more to that and let the hate flow through you. But that comes to one of the bigger problems of season four. Eleven, she can have annoying times, but I mean she's the core of this series. She's a damaged girl, and when she ripped the helicopter down. In that second to last season, I was like, damn. That was another one where in a lesser show, I'd be like, all right, whatever. She's pretty cool, but it's like she always has that thing where, you know, she do, do her thing, nose will bleed, and then she'll collapse or something. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, all right, we get it, you know? <laughs> we get it. Life's tough. Yeah. I mean, Millie Bobby Vanilli. <laughs> Maybe Millie Boop. Boop. <laughs> Millie Bobby Brown. She's, I mean, she's great. She doesn't have a lot to work with as far as dialogue goes i mean she has to do a lot of like physical acting yeah and she's great at that i mean considering that she started as a literal child it's especially um, impressive in the early seasons where she's like a basically a mute but she has to carry a lot of the story and she's and, got to emote and do all you know like i really i really loved her in like season one where she's like you know she's saying stuff like the bad people are coming to get yeah, me yeah and, and yeah and very simple stuff and it's like you feel for her and you feel an attachment to her, kind of like how the kids felt an attachment to her too, or where it's like you want to protect her at all costs kind of thing. Yeah. Murray, our, our resident conspiracy theorist. Love him. He's I, great. I, he's a lot of fun. Although when I was watching back on season two, I think it was a little weird that he invited Tino to Nature's to spend the night and basically encourage them to fuck. <laughs> I, that was weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was, was a like, little strange. Uh, <laughs> stranger danger. <laughs> yeah. Like, go ahead. Go ahead. You know you both want what? to. Like, I was whoa. like, Murray, did you just put Molly in their drinks? I mean, like, what did you do? He was from Russia, so I mean. Dimitri. R.I.P. <laughs> R.I.P. Dimitri. Yeah. Uh, same for Bob. Bob of season two, I always thought... These are honorable mentions. Correct? These are honorable mentions. Bob, season two. I just kept waiting for the heel turn from not to just be the sweetest guy ever, but he actually just was that, and then he got ripped to fucking shreds. Yeah. Which and really it, hurt. It was funny, because like you said, like when I first saw him, I was like, there's something off about this guy. I thought he was going to be like an undercover or something. That's what I thought, too. I was like, he's a, he's working for the government. Yeah. He's too nice. Yeah. You know, that's just, but no, he's, he's just, just the nice sweetest guy, guy ever. He's Samwise Gamgee. Samwise. R.I.P. Bob. <laughs> Wait, what does he say? 
I can't carry the ring for you, Frodo, but I can carry you. That was basically him, I season two. Him. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I kind of paired these together, Lucas and Max, especially in season four. Lucas and Max, their relationship, I think, really like escalates to being one of the best parts they have of the some show. Great instead of just being like, oh, everybody's getting a girlfriend now. Also, Lucas's acting chops in the the last season. I mean, he's he was great yeah in the finale especially mm -hmm. um with uh his fight with our with our crazed basketball captain yeah. which i thought this show was going to turn into like halloween kills for a minute when he goes to the town hall and he's like no he's a fucking demon worshiper and like the demon worshipers are killing Evil all dies these people tonight. <laughs> yeah that's what i thought was going to happen i thought we were going to get a bunch of like hawkins town just like rage that would have been kind of interesting i, think. I was i was really kind of hoping for that yeah yeah um, yeah, Lucas put them hands on that boy. He was getting his ass beat for a second, though. He folded them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't fuck with Lucas, man. No, but his, his relationship with uh, Max is really cute and, and sweet, and he really cares about her, but Max is very, especially after Billy died, her brother, um, she's very reserved and keeps to herself and is not she was always to talk about anything she was always a sarcastic asshole and in, in that like really like that turned into like her suit of armor in season four after yeah. all the trauma which is if we're going to talk about favorite moments i think the standout moment maybe of this whole show is the max scene where she where uh, kate bush running up that hill is playing where she yeah. escapes vecna that's one i mean tv moments i think that was just i mean it was an amazing scene it was just so beautifully shot uh, especially that wide shot of her levitating mm -hmm. and everybody's like staring staring up at her and uh it's just like with the graveyard behind her and everything it's just a great visual uh especially when she was in the the upside down in vecna's uh in vecna's lair his lair and the color contrast and everything it was just so vibrant and and disgusting too and, and Oh, and awesome. Vecna is kind of this big, and especially that part is this big metaphor for like kind of like PTSD or depression or trauma and like yeah. how it informed, like how it hurts people. And it's, I think it's really beautiful with like the undercurrent of like before this, she was basically saying her goodbyes. She was ready to die. Yeah, she was, she was, her she was accepting her fate. She was writing all these letters to all these people. She's like, don't open them until you know that moment or whatever. And then that moment where she's like, no, I'm going to choose to live. And that I think is like, just it was super powerful. I really yeah. love that. I really love that scene. I really love that moment. I never expected Max to become my one of my favorite characters. She wasn't on the power rankings, but like especially this season, she her she really carried and became a standout. I mean, that's just uh, an attest to the writers again and how they handle the characters in that progression. It's and just, it's awesome. And they're not stuck in the mud. They're not like, oh, we have these four, these four, you know, the four boys and L. Those are that's that's yeah. the group now. They they're, keep adding different people. And they like, they keep adding different people, and they're not afraid to elevate them to an important part of the. And it's kind of a miracle that this even works because anything else that you see, any other show that keeps adding characters usually gets bogged down and all the characters are just so one note and they really never give these characters like time to develop and to shine and get their little moments here and there. But every single character in this show gets a moment. So, some of my favorite part of season four was not the not once the big plot kicks in and Vecna stuff really starts escalating. It's like when they're hanging out. It's like when when uh, Dustin and Mike need to find another partner for for their Dungeons and Dragons game because Lucas is at the big game and yeah. everybody's <laughs> like, "No nerds, we're not going to your stupid nerd club." And they're just going around and they ask Max and Max is like, "Yeah, that'll be amazing." And they're like, "Really?" And she's like, "Hell no, I, that would be terrible. I'm not going to your nerd group." Just great chemistry between all of them. Like. It, it'll never happen but the the stranger things people all just hanging out and having a normal life would also be a good show at this yeah, point we yeah. would just like them hanging out and seeing them go do like regular kid shit yeah and i i agree with that and i guess i can say this or say what i'm feeling about that aspect in the let the hate flow part of our our show but you know i'll, I'll blow, blow up blow up this outline say what you got to say okay so are you saying that these just little moments of them hanging out the high school thing uh well just like the puberty in general or just it really gets childhood in a way that a lot of things don't yeah that 
aspect works so well just because the characters are they have such good chemistry together where this kind of, it makes the sci-fi elements of this show not work as well for me and because it, it borderlines on the ridiculous do you feel that way about earlier seasons or mostly this season i i'm thinking this season in particular because the villain is is very campy he's freddy krueger basically basically um and i understand i get it and he, he's still a cool character and he's interesting and the fact that they were able to tie him with 11 and stuff i mean i find that really interesting but it's just it's just you have these such these grounded characters and then you introduce this sci-fi element and this weird otherworldly dimension where yeah. things are batshit crazy i don't know it doesn't hit as hard for me I mean, the big influence, on, I mean, here, I also made a list of influences. Like, the thing about this show is it's not original. Like, it is original. The The amalgamation of things it's put together is original, but it is drawing from so many yeah. sources. So here's a short list of sources. There's probably a million more that I think it's kind of taken ideas from or aping. Alien. Aliens. The yes. Goonies. It. Inception, E.T., The Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween, Under the Skin, which is a movie I haven't even seen, but all those scenes where Eleven like goes into people's minds and there's like the black all black background with like the water on the bottom, yeah. Yeah. that's a, a Scarlett Johansson movie. There's they do scenes like that exactly like that. Interesting, where, where it's black background. It's like when she's doing some sort of psychic shit and she's walking around. And she's seeing people. Yeah, and she's walking around in like an all black background with water splashing on the bottom. Interesting. Star Trek Beyond, which this might be a different. There might be more examples of this that earlier, but that's the first movie I've seen where they literally turned a, a badass song into a weapon. In Star Trek Beyond, they basically there's like this swarm coming at them, and they're like, "I know how to blow up this swarm," and they just blast the Beastie Boy sabotage. <laughs> <laughs> and it murders this In star trek yes it murders this swarm okay. of yeah they literally play the song like not the soundtrack they are like sound will ruin this like the sound waves will ruin this so they put on sabotage by the beastie boys and it like murders the villain very <laughs> and very that's, that's terrible but interesting <laughs> it in in a in in a lesser movie, it would have been very stupid. Just yeah. like in a lesser show, Eddie Munson playing master, uh, master of Puppets to <laughs> defeat the Demo Bats would have been very stupid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, obviously Vecna is like a big thing. Uh, big Isn't the... Freddy Krueger. So the guy actually... The guy, yes. Who was, they thought was Vecna... What's his name actually? The, the father of who turns out to be Vecna. The father of one. He, yeah, he's the... He's, he, the his older character is played by the guy who played freddy krueger yeah when they go and interview him in the prison that is yeah freddy krueger's actor yeah so that's like i mean uh i mean like i think et and the goonies are all pretty obvious like et they basically flip the we we lift the bikes into the air with in season one when 11 flips the van over yeah, their bikes that was very et um i recognize aliens from season was it season three with the demi dogs or season no season, season two, two with the demi dogs season one is alien there's one alien season two aliens. there's many ends yeah. yeah and sort of like the way the upside down is kind of alienish um and inception is just more like when she starts dropping into everyone's minds and it's like a mind it's like like she goes and she visits she's seeing like max's random memory before she goes to the yeah. to the dance like that's and, kind and of I'm kind of having a hard time. I don't know why out, they showed that. I'm kind of having a hard time figuring out Elle's powers and like how powerful she actually is. I mean that it really shouldn't matter. No, but they, I noticed it, this kind of stuff because I'm like, okay, now she's healing people. There and she's going that, into the past and yeah. I mean that last one was really like before she would see people and I think she could even see memories, but she's like jumping in. She's seeing her memories. Um, but yeah, the, the, the healing people, I think we should maybe come back to that, but that's like the, that's the one that I'm really questioning is when she brings Max back to life. Once yeah, you can do, kind of a... once you can do that, where, what are our stakes actually? Right. Like, what and are we doing? We can get into that later, but that, or fuck, fuck it, let's get into it now. Like, <laughs> okay. so, so, so at the end of season four, Max is basically dead and L 
basically says in her like you know she's doing her mind thing where she's in max's mind she's like no we make our own rules now and she basically resurrects max yeah and max is now in a coma which i'm assuming let's make a bet on this season five she's gonna be in a wheelchair oh i mean she got fucked up i I don't really see any coming back from that i mean i don't know i just think they wouldn't keep her alive unless they're bringing her back to do something yeah she's definitely gonna be back but it's just like I mean, when I I thought she was gonna die, like once they started snapping her all her limbs, I was like, "Yo, she, there's no coming back from that." And I kind of like honestly, I kind of wish yes there was some finality to that. Now that changes the plot because the whole plot is based on four kills, opens the whole thing. I honestly felt like this season should have been it, and the, especially from I mean, I binge watched this all in one sitting. Basically, uh, this felt like a finale. And I hear some people's argument where it's like, well, this is like the Empire Strikes Back where, you know, everybody's, all the heroes are defeated at the end. And, you know, it's their, it's their final confrontation before the final confrontation. And so I, I get that. And I didn't expect them to go scorched earth either, where like the whole Hawkins is just decimated. I wasn't expecting that. Um, so I guess if you can make something cool and something interesting out of it. Yeah, sure. it, but I'd say I'm saving my judgment till what happens in season five like this is the first season of the four where things feel super unsettled at the end like kind of each season's kind of wrapped up there's kind of a hint towards what might be happening next right but it's not like it's not like unsettled like this feels very unsettled this feels like sort of a middle chapter where they're gonna i i hope and i think season five will be the end where they're gonna you know it, wrap it, should, it up and it put a be. and put it a bow on it hopefully but um, no, I, I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Let me go back to what I was saying about the sci-fi elements. I think what really loses me is when we get into like the scientist stuff where <laughs> some of the exposition from some of the scientists, especially like her papa or papa, he, it's pretty bad. <laughs> I'm thinking more so of like when he's talking to her about, um, going back into her past and like revisiting these memories and trying to figure it out. It's just like, it's a little over the top and it's like, you're kind of losing me a little bit. And I found that whole segment to be boring. I was confused why we were doing this whole thing in season four. Like I get it was to get her powers back, I guess, but I was very confused by that. But I guess the whole point is to set up Vecna, which, set up Vecna and get which, the exposition which I did not see that coming. And I don't know if you did. I usually think I have a good eye for like, we're going to, we're going to tease this later, but I did not foresee that this little kid was going to turn be, you know, one, you know, we see, see for the- me, I, I should have not <laughs> looked at Facebook this entire time, but I, I went on Facebook one day and there's literally an article with his face on there with both faces. And was like, I can't believe this. Like, I'm like, uh, fuck you. Damn. Like, God damn and it. I mean, it probably wouldn't have hit me that hard anyways. It's kind of obvious. I mean, once you, get to that section you're like oh well he's the guy yeah. i don't know that sucks because i really didn't picture that at all like i didn't think there was going to be any real like real world connection to vecna i've just figured he was another like Demon. you know he's like he is the the leader of this realm or whatever and he's always been there because it's a new realm i did not picture at all that this you know that the the son in the story which also i was confused at the time like why are we going to interview this guy in the prison like yeah. what what does this long ass story have to do with anything i actually thought his exposition exposition was done pretty well when he was explaining himself it did drag a little bit but i really love the scene where it's like he's transported into this dimension he's like floating through the sky and like pieces of him are just ripping off him and then he's like lands on this strange new world and he's like i'm an explorer now and like it was very cosmic horror-ish and hp lovecraftian and it was it was pretty awesome the visuals in that were great yeah and i didn't expect like they basically tied the whole like our villain to our origin basically which is an interesting trick to pull in season four four yeah (laughs) i mean usually most shows will introduce the main villain on the first season yeah and i think it was a very smart move for them to do because i don't think they could do another they've done three seasons of random monster escapes from the abyss and you know attack from the upside down and attacks well technically it was vecna in season three i know but we don't see we don't meet vecna yeah but i mean he's always been there he's always been that's what i'm saying though is like they this is the part where in the story where they decided we need a mastermind like we need a a character for people to you know talk to 
to that has ideas and plans and yeah. is not just another monster. Because I think if they kept going back to that well, that would have got very dry very fast. And, and I, this, this I think is like you know, it's a it's a new dynamic. There's not we haven't had something intelligent right, as our counterpoint. Right. You um, know, it really adds to the mystique of the whole upside down too, and like what it is. Because I mean, nobody knows what it is, and that's great. Um, I liked his design, but I kept thinking he looked like. Captain uh, Davy Jones from Pirates of the Caribbean. It's because his little <laughs> tentacles are moving on his neck. Yeah, I was like, you look like the squid guy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, honestly, that's really my only gripes about the entire show. I mean, or at least this season. Uh, every season has its issues, um, but they're never enough to destroy it. The production. Yeah. yeah, like I said, there's things that I love that can have flaws, but I don't think that I don't think any of the mistakes made along the way uh, have, like, rip, you know, rip a hole in the show or in my enjoyment of the show. Because, again, go back to, they get the characters right. These are people you want to hang out with. Yeah. So, I, I will go along with some of the missteps and some of the stuff I don't necessarily care about as much. And I don't want to bring this up, but if you want to go... If you want to watch something that's the complete opposite of this, watch Obi Wan Kenobi, and you'll know exactly what we're fucking talking about. All right, so an image that kept popping into my mind as I was watching the last two episodes, which got broken off from the rest of season four and released a month later, which I guess was to finish special effects, and I think they didn't really do the show a good service. I think it would have been better to watch, be able to watch all together, because I think some of the hype and some of the, they were really hyping it, and I think just, I mean, it was just another two episodes of the show. The second one was really long, yeah, but it was, you know, just more of the show. Yeah, it felt a little unnecessary. Um, I'm not really with, like, waiting to watch something. I know The Boys does, like, weekly episodes. I'm not for it's that. It's probably better for Netflix's bottom line if they start releasing stuff weekly. You You think so? Yeah, because people will watch this and they'll unsubscribe. I just don't have patience for that. I mean, personally, I don't have patience. Yeah, but but the image that kept popping up in my mind during those last two episodes was this kind of deep cut re reference for most people. But Kalen, you'll get this. Is you know, in the the behind the scenes of the making of the Phantom Menace, after they finish watching it in that room full of producers, <laughs> and they they finish it, and everybody's just kind of and it's done and they're, they're all just sitting there just completely just like dumbfounded and silent and Everybody's then got their hands on their chins and yeah stuff. <laughs> and then george lucas just quietly mumbles i think i might have got too far in a, in a few places it's a little disjointed it seems like a lot of short scenes it's bold in terms of jerking people around but i may have gone too far in a few places that's kind of how i felt about the end of this season which to start, and it, I was watching season four when I really like started to like, like preach to you to watch this show. At the beginning of the season, I was really like, "This is amazing that they keep adding these characters and they keep being fun." And there's so much going yeah. on, and it's grown from this tiny story of like one monster in a thing to like this whole big sort of epic. Yeah, that's fucking continent spanning, and there's like twenty different characters, and there's so much going on, and I still like like and enjoy almost all of it. Yeah that but once it came to like wrapping it up which also this is the first one that didn't completely wrap it up and that's part i think part of our a little bit of disappointment it got a little messy and it got a little like whoa, like everything's happening all at once like like yeah and it, it i don't know if you felt this way but i i was a little it was a little jarring to keep cutting back to like different subplots Holy shit. So I was There's a lot going on. I was doing the math on it. So we have our Russia subplot. We have our um, fight Vecna in the underground subplot, which is itself three different subplots. Yes. It's uh, Eddie and Dustin. It's Steve and Nancy, Nancy and, and Robin. Robin. And then it's uh, it's Lucas, his sister. And, the, and, and then eventually Jason shows up to go punch him. Yeah, there's a lot going on. And then it's then you got Mike then you got and Eleven and, and, and Mike and Jonathan and Argyle. And they're all doing their own thing. And they're getting her in a vat. And then it, it really starts to show when like four of our main characters, really like 
three because Argyle is just kind of guy that hangs around and makes jokes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and three of our main characters have nothing to do in our season four finale but sit around and be like, yeah, L, go. Go, L. <laughs> Elle, you're doing something. <laughs> they don't know what's going on, and they, <laughs> and they I know really, something is there. And but. for a show that's done, like, teen love and, like, all these things so well, I really hated Mike's speech to Elle, where he's like, I really love you, and you're great, and you're amazing, and you're powerful, and I think you're the best, because it felt so adult. And for so long, yeah. this show has been, like, knows how to handle teen love. They even do it well with Lucas and Max. When Lucas and Max are having their little talk with their little notes... And he's like, we should go to a movie. And she's like, yeah, this is amazing. That's cute. And that's adorable. And yeah. that's heartwarming. But then they do this. And it feels like just just very, it just feels like a rom-com. It feels like a bad rom-com it or feels something. To- like it's, each, each different subplot feels like a totally different show. Yeah. And, and that just that part in particular, I was like, this is, why did all of a sudden this gear shift into very adult? It was just no, too no, adult. I, I thought... The way that Mike's character is, hand, is being handled is... He kind of got shafted in season yeah, four. Yeah, and it's like, he's always... And I understand, because now it's like, uh, Will, it's like telling, well, you're the heart and soul of the group, and, you know, everybody listens to you, and we all come together when you're at the, the lead kind of thing. And that's what he was in the earlier seasons. And now he's like, I mean, I guess that's part of the progression, too, where it's like, maybe his relationship with Elle is like, he's kind of blocking all that other stuff off because he wants to focus on her. I mean, it's his first love or whatever. I mean, yeah. it's it's fine. Classic teen shit. You yeah. you get a girlfriend and the boys are like, "Bro, what's going on?" But then just having him literally not do anything, that doesn't help either though. You yeah. Know? <laughs> or like when Will's pouring his heart out and clearly he's having problems and Mike's just completely oblivious. I mean, it's it, and that's what I loved about that scene in particular cuz I mean, he was talking about L, but he was talking about himself and his feelings towards Mike. I mean, at least that's how I yeah, interpret it. Yeah. For sure. And I think that was very well uh, very well done and very well earned as a character for him to do that. And Mike, yeah, like you said, Mike is just sitting there like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, and we'll and he did that with L too. when she was getting bullied. Like, yeah. I was like, what the fuck, Mike? Yeah. I mean that I can, yeah. Like, I think it's acceptable for him to be a little like, what do I do in this town that I don't live in? Like I'm on a trip. Like, I can't start punching people in California. What if it's for your woman? I mean, I guess. I guess it was just like, and then also she did like brutally like concuss and like break this girl's skull out. And she's like, I got no powers, but I got a fucking roller skate, bitch. Hey, it's not like she didn't deserve it. She deserved it, but I was like, damn. (laughs) She got fucked up. But yeah. Um, But that's what I kept coming back to. It was like, oh. I think I might have gone a little too far in a yeah. few places. Like, that's what it felt like. It felt like there's a little too many, there's too many subplots. And then some of the subplots, they didn't let breathe or they didn't have what to do. Like, Russia felt really disconnected. Like, they were doing stuff, but it actually, I don't think, did much. Didn't really have anything no, to do with it. they were with. saying that what they were doing was for the kids' safety. But it was like, what what effect did it actually show in the show? I guess it did, I don't, did it do something? I don't, I don't know. I don't remember. I don't and remember. that's kind of the, que- that's kind of the problem. That is the problem. It should be clear what they have done to, you know, further the plot, help the plot, help the kids, whatever. I like, I actually didn't mind for the most part the Russia subplot. Once everything starts going at the end, they did get a little annoying to be like, this feels really disconnected from the rest. And it has like a different tone. Earlier on, I liked it because it was like, this is a long show. Sometimes I need a break to have like yeah. something different. Yeah. But at the end, when everything's wrapping up and like. Well, I didn't like how it's like. <laughs> okay they find a way to get out or it's like he escapes and then he gets captured again and then they escape and they're like oh well we gotta go back i'm like fuck just leave like yeah like no you don't need to do all that but i mean again these are minor nitpicks in the this grand expanse of this entire show these are so minor yeah where everything else i give very high praise for um this is the best show on netflix hands down well that's debatable I think Midnight Mass is the best, is the best show on Netflix. Midnight Mass is a very good show. Maybe yes. Watch Midnight Mass. That's um, probably a better show. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a totally different era. It's also one season. and Yeah, yeah. whatever. This is it's a great show. If you haven't watched it already, go watch it. I mean, yeah. if you need something to binge watch, I mean, it's all on there now. You have right. no reason not to. Right. So. Go watch it. It's good. It's fun. The characters are lovable. It's it's full of, like, it's got, it's got 80s nostalgia. It's got humor. It's got horror. It's got family values. Like it's got everything. Yeah. It's it's a good show. 
it's maybe a little crass and scary for the youngins, but otherwise. Yeah, it gets pretty dark. Just <laughs> about everyone. Like, yeah, it's funny because when I watch it sometimes, I'm like, this is a family show. And then somebody's like, shit! And well, then somebody gets decapitated. Yeah. And like, oh, this is technically See, a horror Season show. four really ramped up the horror. Like, the early murders of Vecna were like. Pretty grisly. Yeah. Fuck. Like exorcist <laughs> level. <laughs> yeah. You're like, damn, those people got wrecked. <laughs> Yeah, go watch Stranger Things if you haven't already. Uh, it took me a while to get into it too, but I mean, once I got into it, I was like, "This is this is great." Yeah, and I don't I'm think exci- I'm excited for more. So. It's one of the few things that is both I think has mass appeal, can a lot of people can enjoy, and that I also think is really excellent and like really. Yeah, that's one thing I could say. This is a cultural phenomenon that I don't hate. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that you I know? that I'm not over. Yeah, yeah, like Marvel uh, Marvel movies. At this point, are dead. a decade later, I'm over it. Now, maybe if Stranger Things continues for a decade, I'll be over it too. It better not. Every good thing must come to an end eventually. And yes. It, season five needs to be it. That's that's what I think. Yeah. So. And I actually did read some stuff where they were talking about, like, we don't want to be one of those shows that goes on and on and Thank on. God. We want to put a wrap on it. We want to put a bow on it. And I think season five might be the end. Because the longer you go, the more resentment there is. I look at Game of Thrones. That went on for eight seasons. Look at The Office. <laughs> Look yeah. at like every show. Yeah. Mo- yeah. Almost every successful show goes on too long and it just and ruins yeah. it by the end. Yeah. So watch it now while it's fresh and it's, it's good because you never know they might fuck it up. So. <laughs> yeah. So go watch Stranger Things. It's got our, pr- our, our seal of approval. We got the rubber stamp out. It is not a perfect movie because it's not a movie. Yeah. So it does not qualify. I don't want to hear anybody say, well, this isn't a movie. Why are you guys reviewing this? It's a special episode, get over it.